So welcome. Welcome to the Fitch Colloquium. My name is Jorge Otero Pailos, and I'm the director of the Historic Preservation Program here at Columbia University. Uh, Dean Andraus could not join us this morning, so it's my pleasure to warmly welcome all of you here and those of you attending online through our live stream uh, to the Fitch Colloquium, Record, Replay, Experimental Preservation Technology. And I uh, intentionally reduce the resolution here of the screen so we can talk about resolution a little bit later. Um, um, we're going to ask some really essential questions today. Can emerging technologies deepen our understanding and enrich our experience of built heritage? Can these new technologies not only improve the daily practice of preservation, but effectively inform an entirely new paradigm of cultural heritage. At Columbia, we believe that emerging technology, when developed and applied through the humanistic framework that underpins our profession, is indeed an essential thread in weaving together a new future for preservation, one in which our profession can and must broaden its positive impact on society. Fitch held this belief when he started the preservation program here and the, uh, the first preservation program in the US in 1964. And 13 years later in 1977, largely through the efforts of Professor Norman Weiss, Columbia was the first university to offer instruction in what we now call preservation technology. Now the first generation of leaders in the discipline was trained here. Some of you are here today. And after four decades, we must renew our investments in the next generation. So this symposium celebrates the opening of our new preservation technology laboratory, which you see pictured on the screen here. We had a very fun ribbon cutting yesterday uh, to celebrate both uh, St. Valentine's Day. We had a very nice red ribbon. Um, and it was followed by a keynote by uh, Professor Norman Weiss in honor of his contributions to our pr uh, program and really to the discipline of preservation at large. The lab is a new platform for teaching and research into emerging technologies and into preservation, the future of preservation. We combine our long-standing expertise and materials with the new advanced technologies in 3D scanning, printing, robotics, and computation. So today, our distinguished speakers will, will share with us their cutting edge work, their cutting edge research in developing new technologies and their experimental applications to build heritage. We will explore high resolution 3D scanning, gaming, machine vision, artificial intelligence, bioengineered bacteria, the science and art of smell, data crowdsourcing, enhanced reality, and other exciting new directions in which preservation and preservation technology are taking us. The day will be organized in three panels um, called Record, Remaster, and Replay. Um, and, you can, and you can see in that, in that setup already the, the, the idea of what preservation technology, you know, how it's making us think about the workflows in, uh, in preservation. Uh, th there'll be three moderators. Erica Avrami uh, will moderate the first panel, David Benjamin the second, and I will moderate the third one. Um, uh, Erica is our, our very own uh, James Marston Fitch Professor of Historic Preservation. Um, an expert in preservation policy, and the author of, editor of Preservation and the New Data Landscape. So today we're also celebrating the launch of this important book, which begins to put data and preservation technology in the framework of policy. How does policy both respond to the new emerging uh, technologies and also, how do the new technologies challenge new ideas about uh, preservation policy? So I encourage you all to uh, grab a copy. We'll try to have a few of these in the, in the back. Actually, you can't grab a copy. Don't they have to buy it? They have to buy it, right? Like they have to <laughs> um, 
So uh, I will introduce David Benjamin later before his, um, his, uh, his panel. Um, so today's colloquium uh, will help us unpack and speculate on the future of preservation and the new disciplinary paradigms that might emerge in response to this current upheaval in technology that we are all living through. So please join me in welcoming the speakers to Columbia University and Erica to the podium. Thank you very much, Jorge, uh, and welcome all. Uh, we're very excited about uh, what we have in store today with all of these distinguished speakers. Um, this first uh, session is aptly titled Record. Um, and when we say record in this context of heritage conservation, we often uh, think about capturing a place uh, in a particular uh, moment in time. Uh, and the four distinguished speakers that we have on the panel this morning challenge those traditional connotations of this act of recording. Uh, they explore questions beyond our examination of the object. They consider issues of context, both temporal and environmental. They look to actions and relationships of humanity vis-a-vis -vis these things that we designate as quote-unquote heritage. And they also examine new kinds of access and more importantly, curatorial power when it comes to understanding these places, not only within the built landscape, but in the context of our societies. So one of our speakers this morning is actually going to be joining us in absentia, digitally, appropriately, given the topic of, uh, of today's uh, symposium. So uh, I'm going to first introduce a speaker, have them come up to the podium, and then subsequently introduce each following speaker at the time of their talk. Afterwards, we'll have uh, some question and answer. I'll do some moderating from the table, and then we'll open it up to the floor for a few questions as well. So our four speakers today are Eve Ubelman, David Gisson, Hannah Louie, via um, a recorded uh, uh, talk, and Anais Aguirre. First on the docket is Eve. Eve Ubelman is president and co-founder of Iconum, an independent architect from 2006 to 2010. Here, join me. <laughs> <laughs> well. He surveyed, studied, and interpreted archaeological sites in Syria, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. This experience inspired Eve to develop a new high-tech approach to using photogrammetry to survey archaeological sites. Co-founded by Eve in 2013, Iconum specializes in the digitization of endangered cultural heritage sites in 3D. Now present in 28 countries, its expert team travels the globe, combining the large-scale scanning capacity of drones and the photorealistic quality of 3D to create digital replicas of our most treasured places. Thank you. Thank you all for having me here. I'm glad to open this. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I'm um, so I'm an architect, and, and, and all the work uh, I did with uh, we did with Iconem is uh, rooted in my own experiences on the field. I was working uh, with archaeologists in Afghanistan in 2010 when I was witnessing the disappearance of archaeological sites. Before many reasons, there is like uh, urban spread, there is uh, 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 lootings, war. And the very first time I, I wanted to apply a new technology uh, uh, for digital preservation, it was here. We are in Mesainak, south of uh, Kabul in Afghanistan. And the site, the archaeological site uh, you will see here, uh, will disappear completely because there is a copper deposit underneath. And there is a Chinese company who want to dig it uh, to... to to, to work with the, with, the, with the copper. And the archaeologists found here a nice uh, civilization, Kushano Sanit civilization, with a, a dozen of monasteries and uh, hundreds of sculptures like that. And it's not possible to move this sculpture because it's earthen sculpture. So we had to, to, to find another way to keep the memory of this site. So that's why we, we, we have been proposed to the Afghan government to use, it was in 2010, it was at the very beginning of the drones, and we have to, to build 
ourselves, our drone, to use this kind of uh, technique to take thousands of pictures here uh, on the site. Using different techniques, this is one kind of drone, this is another, and also a uh, picture uh, from the ground with different kind of camera. And the idea was to use the drone as a scanner at the size of the landscape, huh? taking uh, un hundreds of pictures, uh, hundreds of pictures, and then after you can stitch uh, a different level of, of picture, picture from high uh, uh, altitude, low altitude, picture from the ground, in order to create like a full a 3D model, a full representation uh, of the site uh, itself. And the very interesting uh, um, feature of the photogrammetry is it allows us to represent the site at different scale, at the scale of the landscape, at the scale of the architecture. So this is a kind of result we can get with this data. This is a monastery, for example, so you are at the scale of the architecture, and then you can zoom in and enter in very, very accurate uh, detail of uh, architecture. So this requires uh, uh, to manipulate uh, big data in 3D, yeah? and this, uh, um, uh, this means uh, a big challenge, how to get all this data accessible to non-specialist people, to archaeologists, because this is interesting for archaeologists. So that's why we, we have been uh, we have worked a lot in um, in a platform. This is a platform, so you can see a point cloud, and you load the cloud uh, where where you zoom in in different places. So the idea of this digital platform is to facilitate the access to the this kind of complex data, this uh, big data to people who are not uh, 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 engineers, who just want to use this data to, to study the site itself. So the uh, digital tool is a bridge between uh, remote places. So these places today is not accessible anymore because there is Taliban all around. So between uh, uh, places and a uh, scientific community who use it uh, to uh, continue the study, the scientific study uh, uh, on, uh, in, in this site. So once we have this kind of tool, uh, we, we decided as, a, as a, I mean, the acquisition process is very fast because it's just one uh, few hours or one or two days on the field uh, to get the picture, we decided to make like an extensive uh, uh, atlas uh, of uh, Afghan uh, uh, archaeological sites uh, in uh, Bamiyan, in Erat, in, uh, in Mazar, but also in other countries. So a few years later, uh, started the conflict in Syria and Iraq. And uh, we decided to apply uh, the same, uh, the, this concept of emergency uh, documentation uh, in, uh, uh, in Syria. So you can see also, you, you can have this, uh, this documentation in, uh, in, uh, in space, but also in time. Huh? You have different layers who follow uh, the evolution of the excavation itself. So you can go back uh, in, in the time to see uh, how was the site uh, before. So then we started working uh, in Syria. So we, we proposed to Syrian archaeologists uh, to, to use uh, this, uh, this, this technology uh, in order to document uh, the threatened site, like Palmyra. And uh, it was like a deal. Huh? We provide uh, the technology, and they provide us the access. So that's why I was uh, one of the first uh, foreigners to, to arrive with a team of uh, Syrian archaeologists on the site itself of Palmyra, and we decided to document everything there. So this is the Temple of Bell. Uh, have you seen? This is the Museum of Palmyra, and the idea was to take, again, thousands of pictures inside the museum to document the destruction itself of the collection of the Museum of Palmyra. And we negotiate with the soldier not to go inside the museum in order to keep all uh, the detail of the destruction done by uh, Islamic State. Uh, so there was still this uh, artifact uh, on the wall, but the face was cut and uh, the face was uh, on the ground. So based on all this picture, we were able to, to rebuild like a map of the destruction uh, of the museum 
It's like a fo forensic investigation. But it's very important to keep it because a few days later, all the collections were, were bring back to Damascus, to the storage. So this gives us uh, also a way uh, of traceability uh, for the artifact itself. Uh, if there is an artifact to disappear, we can uh, keep in this document uh, 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 the record of the artifact as it was uh, uh, before the opening of the Museum of Palmyra. Uh. And then after we, we, we get to the, to the, to the tombs, uh, here it is a tower tomb, so we digitalize all the destroyed to to tower tombs, but there is also underground tomb in Palmyra, so we were uh, looking for uh, this tomb. So when we saw, so we saw this picture from, from the drone, there is like a defensive wall, but you see inside there is a, a stair going down. So we decided to go uh, thanks to this kind of uh, picture, to, to go there, and we, we, we took the stair, and we, we rediscover one of the biggest, uh, the most famous tomb of Palmyra, uh, the Three Brothers tomb, that, was, that wasn't destroyed, because uh, this tomb was uh, used as a, as a cover uh, against uh, the aerial bombing. So, uh, soldier of Islamic State just cover uh, the representation of human body, as you see here, but they use this space uh, in a manner uh, uh, of, um, of uh, living. So we can document the destruction, but we can also uh, document the conservation in uh, military purposes. Huh? And this is uh, the famous painting of this tomb. It was just covered by a white uh, painting, and this, uh, this uh, room was used as, as a... As a as a living room for, for soldiers. Huh? And uh, some tombs wasn't accessible, uh, so we, we used this kind of, uh, of uh, device, like a, it's like a coloscopy, huh? <laughs> to see inside. Uh, <laughs> sorry for the comparison. <laughs> It's not so funny, but uh, we, we were able to see that some uh, uh, artifacts uh, disappear, huh? and we were able to, to to share this information with uh, Interpol, uh, because uh, Interpol are looking for this artifact in the market uh, today. Uh. And then this is the uh, Temple of Bell, so completely destroyed. Uh. So what is interesting is to study uh, the destruction itself uh, and the state of conservation of each block. So you can see if it will be possible or not to, to rebuild it in the future. Uh, this is interesting uh, information for experts, so you can see the red blocks here uh, in good shape and the, the white is uh, broken blocks. Uh. And then after, uh, we use, with the same technology, uh, archive imagery. So this is image from the same temple from 1930s, taken by uh, an architect, a French architect who studies this temple. So you can use it uh, to rebuild, uh, digitally the temple as it was before. Huh? So then after you can overlap uh, the, so the destruct temple as you see here and uh, the temple uh, in red that is the temple uh, before its destruction and see uh, in, de in detail uh, the position of different uh, stones that we can see here on the floor and uh, we can uh, imagine the original place of this stone and we 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 get we, we got f further with um, with the arch. This is the arch, so you can simulate the destruction itself. Right? So using the old documentation, you rebuild uh, the arch as it was before, and then after you make the simulation, and so you see if the blocks are on the ground. So behind this, there is a wall database uh, with each block, each dim dimension, and this also uh, is good help for uh, for the architect. Uh, to, to imagine uh, the future reconstruction, what we call an ana anastylosis, but a digital uh, ana uh, analysis. <laughs> and, and then we, we document also other monuments, like the theater, and uh, as you may know, uh, Daesh came back a few months later in Palmyra, and again uh, destroyed some monuments like, uh, like the theater. So we have the theater in 3D before the destruction and after the destruction. So that's why it's very important uh, to be uh, on the field uh, 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 as soon as possible. Huh? 
because we keep uh, a record of uh, uh, this kind of heritage who, who disappear very, very fast. Huh? And then after we, we try to, to, to apply the same technology to the big city. Huh? So this is, this is Aleppo. The idea is with this huge da data management, you can now uh, digitalize a whole city. Huh? So, uh, so the historical center of Aleppo from uh, 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 from aerial view, but also from inside, from the souk. Huh? This is, for example, uh, uh, I try to. This is a 3D model of the souk. So we, we, we build like a specific uh, um, um, hardware with different camera to take picture every meter to, to have like this full reconstruction uh, of the souk. Uh, 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 kilometers of souk, huh? and this is also very fast. It's just f a few a few hours uh, on the field, huh? and then after. Based on this model, you can use it for different kind of analysis, structural analysis, and see also uh, the strategy of uh, restoration uh, be behind. Huh? Uh, and this is an aerial picture of, uh, of Aleppo, so you can see the kind of destruction. This is a RPG destruction here uh, with rockets. This is aerial bombing, and you can read also uh, the process of destruction itself of the city. Huh? And uh, this, there is a reoccupation of the place. Uh, you can see the antenna uh, between the, the impact of the bombs. And here, this is, this is tunnel bombing. So rebel group, they dig a tunnel. They put uh, explosive inside, and, and then they blast a, a huge part of the city. Huh? And uh, it's very impressive to see from the ground. And, um, and um, and that is uh, the raw material that architects today uh, use uh, for, uh, to imagine the future of, the, of, the, of Aleppo itself. Huh? And then after, we, 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 we wanted also to, to work in Iraq in a different way, because uh, uh, we went in Iraq at the time uh, Mosul was uh, still uh, the capital of uh, Islamic State, and we asked uh, Peshmerga uh, people here, to bring us to the front line uh, with uh, this kind of specific drone, it's long range drone, who can fly over uh, 200 kilometers. And that, well, then we send the drone to Mosul just to survey the Mosul uh, during the occupation of uh, Islamic State. So the drone come back after one hour with all the picture, and then you can use this picture to rebuild uh, a 3D model of, uh, of, the, of the city. And a few uh, months later, UNESCO asked us to come in Mosul, but after the bombing, after the Battle of Mosul, and to make an overlap with this documentation from before. Huh? And this is uh, Mosul after the bombing, after the battle. So, uh, so at this time, we were able to, to go to the field, huh? to go to, to the site. And here, you have uh, this uh, huge amount of data. It's uh, billions of billions of points. So you can uh, make an assessment of uh, each uh, buildings uh, based on this, and there is a team of, uh, from UNESCO who are working today to assess the general conservation of, uh, of the city of Mosul. So this raw data is very important in, uh, in a collaborative uh, work uh, between, uh, between architects, between politics, between, uh, um, to, to, to restore, enfin, to imagine uh, the strategy of re, uh, for the restoration of the Historical, uh, historical city. Huh? And outside, but also inside, huh, uh, the main monument was scanned also uh, from, from inside. So it's just, again, uh, 10 days of work on the field, so it, it's very fast. Huh? And uh, so this is the church, the main church of Mosul. And then after, you, you can make maps on different, with different layers of analysis. Uh, respect to the eye of the building, respect to the destruction, respect of many things, and then draw the cadaster uh, in few in few weeks, uh, uh, the post drama uh, cadaster of the of the city. Uh. So then, uh, using this technique, we were able to to build like a, a extensive li li library of uh, of many sites from uh, many countries. And we decided also to, to use this data not only in scientific purposes, not only in architectural purposes, but also uh, to build exhibition. Uh, uh, and for us, it's very important to use also the imagery in order to bring this important subject of preservation of the memory 
to the public, to the general public, but also to political leaders. So this was the first exhibition we did. It was in uh, two, two years ago in uh, Grand Palais in Paris in partnership with uh, Le Louvre. So it is like a full uh, mapping of uh, video mapping of, uh, of, uh, of the site all around uh, the visitor uh, that bring uh, the architecture to the, uh, to the visitor because the visitor can, cannot go go there, and, uh, and the idea is to, sh to show the richness, uh, richness of this culture about Syria, Iraq, here, and, um, and, uh, and Afghanistan. Uh, this is the same, uh, the same exhibition. So it's uh, immersive experiences of these sites that are not accessible anymore. And this is another one. It's just closed uh, after two days, something like that. In, uh, it's uh, currently in Paris, in l'Institut du Monde Arabe. Uh, this is uh, so the mapping of video mapping of Aleppo, video mapping of Leptis Magna in Libya, video mapping of uh, Palmyra, and uh, with uh, headset experiences, uh, with uh, real-time uh, 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 experience inside uh, inside the different sites. And uh, this is just uh, the video. created the, the tool itself to produce uh, this kind of, uh, of exhibition. So for us, it's more than uh, an exhibition. It's, uh, it's uh, part of our activism. We try to bring this project to political leader. Uh, indeed, the first exhibition was opened by François Hollande. This one was opened by Macron. And we try to convince this uh, these leaders to, to, to act uh, for, this, for the subject of the conservation of the, of the memory and, and to make us available to transmit this uh, uh, site uh, to the future through this technology. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eve. Our next speaker is David Gisson. Uh, David Gisson is the author of the book Subnature, Architecture's Other Environments and Manhattan Atmospheres, Architecture, the Interior Environment, and Urban Crisis. His historical reconstructions, reproductions, and restorations have been exhibited at the Canadian Center for Architecture, the Venice Biennale, and numerous additional galleries and museums internationally. He is professor at the California College of the Arts and university professor at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna, Austria, and I believe may be relocating soon to our coast uh, to the new school. So we welcome him to New York. Um, and he is a former visiting professor here at Columbia uh, and the PhD program in history theory and criticism of architecture and art at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. David, welcome. <laughs> Um, thank you, Erica and Jorge, for the invitation. It's very nice to be here. So my talk today examines the environmental reproduction of cultural artifacts. Um, okay. I'm interested in the way we can negotiate certain intrinsic aspects of the reproduction of artifacts. So these things include um, qualities such as brightness and darkness, chromaticity, contrast, noise, reverberation, and frequency to represent the environmental histories of artifacts. And, any of you who have ever recorded audio or taken a photograph of a building, a sculpture, a painting, Xeroxed, or scanned a text have had to negotiate um, these aspects of the reproduction process. So um, I just want to briefly, in the time that I have, take you through a few techniques, but I also want to relate these to some contemporary and historic themes in the reproduction of, uh, of cultural artifacts. So some of the work that I'll show you today relates to um, work I've done in, in the lab that I um, uh, co-direct with uh, my colleague Armin Cheng at the California College of the Arts and a, an alum of Columbia, as well as conversations related to a new initiative that I'm taking on with somebody named Jennifer Steger, a professor at Johns Hopkins, um, called The Copy Shop. So as many of us in the room are aware, um, particularly speakers today, the digital reproduction of cultural artifacts has kind of arrived as a cultural form in and of itself. So these reproductions, both, both ones well-made and not so well-made, have, um, have figured very prominently within public events in, in often surprising ways. So here you see this 2016 display in Trafalgar Square of a partial-scale digital reproduction of the Arch of Palmyra, something 
a site that Eve was just talking about. Um, and it became a backdrop to a speech by Boris Johnson about uh, Middle Eastern politics today. And here, the digital reproduction is, public, is positioned as a way for um, a public thousands of miles away from the site to imagine how to recuperate what's been destroyed and lost and, and their role in that recuperation. So in terms of public visibility um, and political utility, digital reproductions have figured prominently in discussions of repatriation and restitution. Um, this can be seen in something such as the digital reconstitution and repatriation of Veronese's wedding at, at Cana. This was um, stolen by Napoleon's administrators 200 years ago from Venice. It was digitally reproduced by Factum Arte in 2007 and reinstalled in its original location in Venice in 2007. And this um, was, at the time, was one of the largest and maybe one of the most famous digital reproductions of an artifact when it was installed. So the digital reproduction has also emerged um, as an object that can demand a surprising amount of public um, concentration, like a public visual concentration. And, and this, relative to the original artifacts that we think of as being more, the more common draw for people to, um, to experience or have an aesthetic kind of sensibility or knowledge of the past. So blockbuster exhibitions, which you're seeing here, such as Gods in Color, um, which displays polychromatic reconstructions of Greek and Roman artworks that were originally made through digital processes, have traveled the world for the past 10 years. And these exhibitions have been at the center of, of very interesting controversies in culture about representation and race, for example, in antiquity, and have raised various issues regarding the, the license of those people who reproduce artifacts in terms of their imagination of, 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 of how things um, are recovered and what things look like in the past. So other exhibitions, such as the Lost Museum, which is at Berlin, which was a display of works damaged and destroyed during World War II in Berlin, are predicated also on an appreciation of reproductions. And then, in an architectural and fine art context, the Victorian Albert Museum's exhibition, A World of Fragile Parts, at the 2016 Venice Biennale, was completely made of contemporary digital reproductions and mixed with more historic reproduction techniques like plaster casts. So this particular exhibition uh, marks my own um, entry point into this kind of realm of digital productions uh, and reproductions and preservation that we're discussing today. So in 2015, the, the curator of this exhibition, Brendan Cormier at the VNA, asked if I could connect some written research that I had done on environmental history um, of buildings and landscapes with a potential digital reproduction for this exhibition. So I think, the, the, I think we might hear about this more from Anais, but the idea of the Victorian Albert Museum's curators was to stage a kind of contemporary cast court and using contemporary photogrammetric laser and printing techniques for capturing um, art and architecture. So one of the things that, that, that interested me and, and the group that I work with at, at the California College of Arts um, is the, the kind of marked absence of any idea of, of environment um, in a lot of digital reproduction practices. And I would describe this simply as the kind of mediating realm between something, somewhere, at some time, and the subjects who perceive it or have perceived it. So another way to state this is that something like photogrammetric reproduction operates through a very specific interpretation of documentary photography. It, it captures the, um, the image form of a building or landscape through the best practices of archival studio photography. And I'll talk about the implications of that a bit um, later and, and the historical implications of that as well. But this particular exhibition initiated some responses to this. So, you know, particularly here at Columbia um, in the preservation program, the impacts of photography on the preservation of buildings has been analyzed very intensely. Um, and so it's generally results in a kind of um, pronounced optical bias to what gets recovered preserved and reconstructed from the past, the more and more photography infiltrates the, um, the preservation um, practices of today. So again, I want to return to um, some of the implications of photographic sensibilities um, of photogrammetry in a minute. But in terms of the context of this exhibition uh, staged by the Victorian Albert Museum, I became interested in a whole set of additional tools outside the photographic and that have something to contribute to our understanding of the documentation and digital documentation of a building and its form. Um, these figure much less prominently in contemporary discussions about digital preservation. And so what you're seeing here is a, you know, there's, there's a photograph on the left and a drawing, a diagram on the right for the setup to create what's called an impulse response. And these are used to capture the um, reverberative acoustic energy in a space. 
And they can be utilized in something called a convolution reverb processor. Some of the people speaking today probably work with these tools. So this enables any audio to remotely sound as if it's in a particular space, not actually in that space. Um, and the right image helps explain a bit on the process. It's usually some kind of loud um, noise is set off digitally or, or, or to boot through a pistol shot or clapping of hands. That's then captured by audio equipment digitized in a computer, and then that becomes a, a kind of algorithm or convolution tool that you can use for other audio. So an impulse response can capture the acoustics of, um, of any space, but there are audio engineers, almost a subculture of audio engineers who travel the world creating acoustic captures of the interiors of various historic um, buildings. And in some cases, there has been, um, their work has been very important in terms of preservation efforts, considering what gets preserved or rebuilt in a space that's undergoing renovation. Um, so for the Victoria and Albert Museum's exhibition, I assembled eight of these uh, different impulses from various global historic monuments. These were all made by other engineers and into an audio piece, which had a somewhat humorous title called Some Small Leaks in Big Spaces. So it essentially acoustically reconstructs eight leaks that have been documented by preservationists, restorationists, architects, or others from around the 19th, between the 19th to the early 20th centuries. So each of these, um, these leaks was the result of different factors, age, um, fire, earthquakes, in the case of a mosque in a Darren war, and others simply neglect. And this formed a sort of, um, unintentionally, I suppose, a background audio for part of the um, exhibition. I think I can play a little bit of it, but is there a keyboard here so I can advance? Okay, hang on. to create a more um, ambient and formless sensibility of the monument. This is an exhibition in which you know, there are quite a few images of destruction, of course, and this creates a kind of different sensibility of the, of the ruin. And in a way, also became a kind of white noise in the exhibition as well. Um, and as you can see from the accompanying text des descriptions, visitors understood that the form and surfaces, the interior spaces of these monuments were constantly changing. There's about eight, and um, again, uh, that became uh, damaged through, ver through various uh, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, forms of ruination. Okay, so in addition to photogrammetry tending to transform um, monuments into giant three-dimensional photographs, digital reproductions also lend artifacts a heightened sense of mobility. And this is some similar to the sensibilities of many plaster casts. And I wanna be careful in mentioning this. So it's not ne necessarily a criticism that um, 
these artifacts appear so um, mobile within these kinds of photogrammetric representations and prints. Because this characteristic, I think, is key to the ways that digital reproductions have been effectively used to make arguments about the restitution of the things that they represent. So, but again, it struck me that many of these um, contemporary reproduction practices are at odds with contemporary historiographical preoccupations. The ideas of a new materiality, environmentality, multi-temporality, among other issues. Now, this, um, this is a controversial um, example who some, of someone who contended with this sensibility in photographs, but 80 years ago, of, um, historic, of, of uh, historic artifacts. So the marble statue that you see um, in all of these images was excavated on the Athenian Acropolis in 1889. It's one of the few surviving sixth century um, Greek statues that has example of polychromy, paint, uh, bits of paint on it. You can see it a bit in the eyes on the left, but also in the hair that has a kind of yellow ochre quality to it. And this lent this statue a very unfortunate name. It's known as the blonde boy among um, those who study Greek antiquities. So these reproductions that you see on the right are, are quite unusual. So in 1939, the German art historian um, Ernst Langlotz commissioned a series of photographs of this statue. And in what must have been a conservator's nightmare, he took this and many other sculptures outside onto the site of the Acropolis, outside in the sunlight, to photograph them in strong and overhead sun. So Langlotz railed against the predominant use of painted black backgrounds, which you can see there, um, in black and white photography of sculpture from the time. And he argued that they placed the experience of sculpture in an indeterminate space and time. So he was a student of um, Heinrich Wolflin, who believed that, that light and lighting and a reproduction could represent a particular way of seeing from a particular time, which I still think is a, is a very interesting idea. And Langlotz was also taken with an idea of somebody, of a, a very well-known Viennese um, art historian, Elias Riegel, um, idea of artistic will, of, of Kunstwollen, which states that the perception of a work and the manner in which it was conceptualized as a formal artifact were intimately related in time and space. Another vision is historically relative. So following these ideas, Langlotz argued that Greek sculptures would have been viewed in their time under strong sunlight, and he believed the strong overhead sun created the correct sense of contrast and shadow for viewing the sculpture and that the form of the sculpture was actually in dialogue with this particular environment. In other words, the sculpture and the environment had to be understood together. So, hence the photographs. So in the past 20 years, artifacts like the blonde boy have been reproduced um, with processes such as laser scanning and photogrammetry, and then printed. This is a photogrammetric model made a year ago by Scan the World from this early 20th century cast of the blonde boy that's held in the Pushkin Museum. So while I scan the world would likely see the digital processes behind this reproduction as some major break in the reproduction of artifacts, we can also see this as something that extends a much earlier history. And so as I mentioned earlier, you know, photogrammetric, photogrammetry, and as we saw in Eve's talk, requires photographic images. And if anything, photogrammetry has made photography more central to, to the reproduction process. So the photographic, um, sense of these artifacts today is close to some of the earliest um, hand-painted photos in which the entirety of a black background was remo removed. And this is precisely the phenomena that inspired Langlotz's explorations of photography, okay, 60 years ago. Okay, so I'm interested in some of the ideas that inspired Langlotz, but of course, I, I question this essentialism that ties the true appreciation of an artifact to a specific interpretation of climate and creation. So a year ago, I was invited to explore how to environmentally reproduce this Roman copy of a Greek Hercules from the first century. This was done as an illustration for a study related to the v and um, REACH project, which we'll hear about later, reproductions of art and cultural heritage. So I wanted to reproduce this artifact in the experience of night in the late 18th and 19th centuries and as it was once viewed. So why am I interested, why, why reproduce this into nighttime? On the one hand, this is meant as a provocation into the environmental history of reproductions. We don't really have um, an environmental history of rep reproducing art, but suffice to say that the modern history of reproducing cultural artifacts demonstrates how certain institutional values, light, clarity, cleanliness, consistency, become imprinted into the global experience of culture more generally. And historically, it's well known that antique marbles had color because they were painted. This is the topic of that Gods in Color exhibition I mentioned earlier. Um, but in the 18th and 19th century, antique marbles were also admired for the manner in which they became highly volatile artifacts relative to their surroundings. 
They could become stained or change with interior forms of illumination and color. Those with the means to collect and view them often display them in contexts that change their chromaticity, such as this space with yellow tinted glass, the Sir John Soane's Museum in London. Today, when we, when we uniformly imagine marbles as white, we're engaging in a contemporary cultural attribution, but it's a cultural attribution that is physically reinforced with solvents, plaster, 3D printing, a gallery's white walls, lighting and acculturated forms of viewing, that is through selective processes of reproduction. So this nighttime reproduction translates the model into the statue's chromaticity under candlelight, gaslight, hearthlight, and ambient night skylight. Before the electrifications of cities, the ambient skylight was much brighter at night than it is today. Um, by again, by translating the model into four forms of light energy, we also bring in an idea of multi-temporality and complexity to reproductions. So, um, this is based upon a photogrammetric model that was created by Thomas Flynn of the statue, and it was relit with the Unix-based radiance platform. Any of you who have ever worked in sustainability or green or environmentalist architecture in the room are probably familiar with that. Radiance was originally designed at Berkeley for modeling energy in architectural spaces. And about 15 years ago, the British computer scientist, Alan Chalmers, demonstrated how radiance could be appropriated to reconstruct historic forms of illumination and reproductions, and with great accuracy. Here it's brought into a, a 3D artifact for the first time. So I think I'm running out of time. Um, but for me, using radiance to, to think about chromaticity and light energy and reproduction was revelatory. So most of us have been taught to think about color spectrally. That is a range of light waves that go from short to higher frequencies, red, orange, green, blue, indigo, et cetera or as a mixture of primary colors when painting or drawing, yellow, blue, and red, and diagrams of these ways of thinking about color are on the bottom. But radiance enables us to think about and recompose color spatially and temporally. This chart shown at the top of this slide shows how a single color of indeterminate value under four different forms of contemporary and antiquated light. And so they're arranged from left to right by those colors that are more, to, more volatile to those that are more stable under different forms of light. Um, for those interested in any of these problems of environmental reproduction, this is a, is a kind of useful way to think about color. So back to the statue. So the photos of the statue were um, from Radiance were brought into a photogrammetric, um, thank you, okay, yeah. Um, were, brought in, were brought into a photogrammetric modeling program that you see here. This embeds or bakes in the colors into the surfaces of the model and enables us to create sensations of color that would be difficult to produce in an actual space. The chromaticity of the, of the object transforms as you turn it. Um, this was then printed in full color on gypsum. As you walk around the reproduction, its color changes. Now due to something, the way our minds work, due to something called the retin retinex effect, most people will see this reproduction of the statue as a white model. It's bizarre. Um, but you're actually looking at something in different colors, and you actually have to display an image behind it that shows its transforming coloration so people that under will understand more clearly how that's happening. So the you'll notice the model has a halftone printing technique because I wanted this to look made, to be a kind of self-evident translation of light into color. So at close distance, the surface of the sculpted form and the coloration cannot be visually resolved. They appear as independent things. So from a purely technical perspective, both of the reproductions I've shared with you utilize or appropriate various forms of energy modeling software to environmentally reproduce artifacts. But the point is not simply to, to enable you to experience light or sound energy. I think at a more conceptual level, the idea of an environmental reproduction enables us to, to begin to sense how others might have come into contact with an artifact, okay? And how a reproduction might become a vehicle to understand the contingency of experience. I'm a bit obsessed with the idea of a reproduction representing a kind of population of observers, if that's at all possible. It's much easier to do with certain forms than others, okay? So out of contrast to those who use reproductions to reconstruct a more kind of univocal image of an artifact that comes from a particular point of view, and their meaning and experiences of time and space that become embedded into that reproduction. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Our next speaker in absentia is Hannah Louie. Uh, Hannah Louie is professor of architecture at the University of Melbourne in the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning. She is an architect and academic with teaching and research expertise in architecture history and theory of the 19th and 20th century. Heritage conservation and the new media in representing, and the use of new media in representing history, place, and heritage. 
She has been a past president of Shahans, the Society of Architectural Historians of Australia and New Zealand, co-editor of Fabrications, chair and vice chair of Docomomo Australia as well. Louis co-edited and co-authored the book Community, Building Modern Australia in 2010. She is currently co-editing and co-authoring two books for publication in 2019, Modern, Australian Mo Modernism and Architecture, Landscape and Design, and the Rutledge International Handbook in New Digital Practices in Galleries, Libraries, Archives, Museums, and Heritage. Unfortunately, Dr. Louis uh, had to undergo uh, back surgery and was unable to fly uh, from Australia. So we do have a video presentation of her talk. This quote here uh, by uh, Christine Boyer on the screen just while I introduce and we'll come back to that at the end of the talk. So extending the trope of the museum without walls from Andre Malraux's conception in the 1940s, this talk explores the promise of historical fabric in cities becoming open to the saturation of digital interpretation as a kind of museum imaginaire. Interpretation is taken here to mean the annotation of places, buildings, markers and scenes with either denotative or poetic explanation. So whether through um, familiar things like signage, touring, visual or textual annotation. Long used in heritage practice to inform about the significance of sites, interpretation has acquired new energy in the post-digital age of ubiquitous and smart computing and holds promise of weaving citations and allusions of the historical past into the present urban context. Drawing on our experience of creating and evaluating a digital application called Passport for local citizens to post and share historical images, memories and information about an area of Melbourne, examples of recent digital techniques of interpretation within urban, urban realms will be examined in this talk today that aim to foster awareness and appreciation of historical and heritage places. Over the last um, uh, a decade or so, digital app-based history and heritage tours and guides have emerged as a familiar way of experiencing the city. Entering a history walking tour as a search uh, term into any app store produces a seemingly endless list of search results that promise to, quote, lose yourself uh, in any given city without getting lost. Although reflecting the usual bias towards the Western world's epicentres of both glam, as in galleries, libraries, archives and museums, and digital content production, the list nevertheless contains a motley mixture of institutionally branded and privately developed offerings. Um, I will give a snapshot of a very small sample of familiar kinds of apps from London and Melbourne today that offer heritage interpretation in the form of guided tours, walks and itineraries. Targeted to a range of audiences, both local or international. Each of these utilises different or progressive, I think, in development. Um, digital platforms and tools including GPS located sound, then and, no, then and now photographic montages using a smartphone camera and so on. This array of visual and oral techniques for emplacing, what uh, Casey's term of emplacing, um, historical artefacts, images and collections into the streets and outside the confines of traditional archives will then be briefly explored. Through research on their creation and user experience, and as we have elsewhere critiqued, the opportunities abound for smart technologies to extend the curatorial presence of cultural and historical organisations into the hands of those who wish to experience and apprehend the city in new ways. And I suggest that the experience can be situated somewhere betwixt and between the wandering of the 19th century flaneur, the 1960s derive, and the formal guided. Since the 19th century, there have been a number of characterizations of the activity of touring in the city um, as a habitual cultural practice, whether as a tourist at home, or abroad and open to urban experience. There also exists an enduring legacy of heritage and historical curatorship that presents places of significance as if like an open air museum, complete with a tour, a guidebook of information, physical or digital signage uh, that reframes the visitor experience. Um, this is a GPS activated tour in, in Docklands in Melbourne. 
Therefore, underlying this recent digital explosion is, of course, the observation that guided tours of places and collections have existed in many pre-digital forms for centuries, either as human guided tours or the self-guided tourist book or the annotated heritage site. And in many cases, the digital ver version can seem like an inferior offspring of these former incarnations. But arguably, when done creatively, they can open up new ways that allow for self-paced freedom to explore and engage between text, image, audio, film and present day situations and realities. So after briefly describing the evolution of four different kinds of digital her heritage touring platforms, I want to come back to a number of these opening threads through this legacy of practice of both walking in cities and of museum and heritage curation and annotation. Uh, so the first, first example, um, this uh, selected pair of tours, is a very straightforward and familiar example of what we've called the click stop tour. Here users are presented with a map which has clickable stops on a defined route that may include mixed digital media, sound and or text. Uh, so in this case this tour is called the Golden Mile, was created as part of the Melbourne Museum's Walking Through History series some years ago and developed through uh, company My Tours. Um, the app tour was based on an existing successful human guided heritage tour of the centre of Melbourne visiting 45 stops of mainly notable 19th century buildings built after the gold boom of the 1880s um, that gave impetus to, to Melbourne's rapid development. The companion tour app, also created by My Tours, was published as part of the Victorian War Heritage Trails um, project. And that one, this is a similar click stop kind of thing, takes a route that passes along the edge of a major urban park and the Shrine of Remembrance. And you can uh, see here that this is a kind of important viewing platform for the city as well. This style of digital tour mimics the established format of human guided tours by presenting a prescribed route of designated significant stops designed for an obedient user with a scripted delivery of manually triggered content at each stop. These ideal users are people who are largely content to be cast as tourists in their own city and are happy with consuming uh, fairly conventional authorised heritage content. Here the city becomes experienced as a series of highlights or what Christine Boyer has described as a scenographic heritage tableau, akin to exhibits choreographed in a museum, yet embedded within the urban everyday realm. In the second example, um, in 2010, the Museum of London, in collaboration with the creative agency Brothers and Sisters, launched the app Street Museum, which was designed to create an immersive museum experience on a phone or tablet outside of the museum's walls. It used geotagging, augmented reality and the phone camera to animate the museum's collections and archives in an attempt to bring history to life at the very spot where it happened. That's their quote. Structured around a Google map, Street Museum created a series of pinned sites linked to a selection of digitised images which were supplanted with brief curatorial notes and context. Some three to four hundred images could be viewed in situ, with users able to manually line up old images with the contemporary view or use the camera function to capture them in either 2D or 3D to create a kind of ghostly overlay. The Museum of London opened in 1976 as the first major museum to be created after World War II uh, in London and their remit was to tell old and new stories about London and Londoners. Staving off a midlife crisis and hoping to lure competition from very crowded cultural, retail and sporting sectors, in the 2000s it began to think about renewal programs, recognising that museums have and need to be rapidly evolving from traditional ways of exhibiting and curating to satisfy a world where, as the former Director of Communications at the Museum of London said to me, quote, all of us are curators now. We all carry mobile devices around with us. We want to dip in and out of content. So the Street Museum app uh, was originally um, designed in part as a marketing tool which aimed to increase traffic to the physical museum, to speak to younger audiences and to collect, take collections out and about uh, into a new generation. The strategy worked. 
Street Museum was a widely acknowledged pioneer in the field of digital museum and heritage apps and was very successful initially with over 10,000 downloads in the first month of release, going on to win a series of awards and returning more than half a million downloads in the first um, uh, couple of years of existence. It's also been highly influential in the heritage and museum sectors. However, in late 2017, Street Museum was taken offline due to budgetary hurdles required to keep it up to date, which is an ongoing issue in digital cultural heritage maintenance and funding models. But the app achieved far more than marketing and brand awareness, as it was pioneering in spatially and temporarily extending the impact of the museum by taking collections out of the confines of the museum space and into the surrounding messy city of London, with endless possibilities of exploration and no set itineraries or tours. The third example, Soho Stories, was also set in London in the area of Soho and was created by the National Trust in 2012. Unlike Street Museum, it used location-triggered audio content only to explore the vivid history of the local area rather than the whole city. The historical oral content focuses on post-World War II street life with stories of personalities and events. Many from the, museum, uh, from the music, music and sex industries that characterise Soho's recent history in the 1960s and 70s. Although the many content hotspots were presented on a map, the central design concept of Soho Stories defied the idea of a prescribed route. Rather, the user is invited to wander, listening through headphones with their smart device tucked neatly out of sight. So unlike the typical click-stop guided tour, here the aim was not the factual delivery of official history, but instead an inspired and personal spoken narrative of past inhabitants. In one view, then, the ideal user of Soho Stories is constructed as a modern flaneur with echoes of the playful derive or drifter, open to eclectic content including poems, ambient sounds and music through which to experience the local place. And further, in the manner of the situationists perhaps, the narratives were often cut into fragments as the user wanders in and out of range of the GPS hotspot. Perhaps slightly counter to this intention of fluidity, the app presented the voice of a human guide, cleverly designed to, prov to provide linking commentary as the user mo moves between these hotspots. But because this imaginary guide is invisible, um, uh, it, it can be um, experienced um, through the spaces anonymously and at will. The fourth example is one that we've created ourselves as part of a large research project entitled Citizen Heritage. Uh, and this is a tour app um, that, and a community-based local heritage sharing tool called Passport um, as part of that project and was designed uh, for experiencing local areas in Melbourne. Passport was an exercise in design-based digital heritage research aimed at local residents who might want to share what they knew or to find out more about their local areas as a kind of tourist at home. Similar in some ways to larger international platforms like Europeana and HistoryPin, it was developed as a web app accessible on any device, our aim being to make it as simple and direct as possible for people to co-curate fragments of information about their local history and heritage pinned to particular locations on a map. Uploaded content can be created by any registered user uh, with each item open to separately viewable um, page of historical content in the form of text, um, of audio, video um, as well. More socially interactive than other tour examples discussed here, in addition to, addition to posting content, users can post questions on the map and flag queries for others in the community and follow standard social media conventions of interaction. Other schemes uh, for orchestrating the historical digital content in Passport are suggested walking tours cu curated by any contributor as a loose sequence of posted items and viewed on the map with a short textual overview of each tour. Um, and themes uh, similarly consisting of related groups of items which can be grouped on the map or viewed as a listing. 
Uh, so here's an example of a theme in terms of uh, demolitions in Port Melbourne um, and example of a walking tour, in this case ghost signs. Uh, we've since developed the whole app for another area um, in uh, near the actual city of Melbourne and uh, doing a number of other walking tours there, say about um, the setting of an Australian film uh, or the kind of com commemorative and contested landscape of a local park and so on. Another feature is the ability to create then and now comparative photos as a way of further animating old archival images and comparing them with the present view, which has proved very popular as a further way of emplacing archival images into contemporary situations um, and a phenomenon that I've become a bit obsessed with and written um, other papers on about this kind of uh, use of re-photography. These combined aims of community-led grassroots sharing plus tour guide were important to us from the outset, but challenging to design and realise. The combination has proved popular to date, supporting John Uri's observations that tourists and visitors often like to loosely follow other people's interests and plans, while others prefer the spatial serendipity of the map. The desire to use digital guides and apps to explore the heritage of one's own city or when travelling to new places can be traced not only to the historical legacy of the touring impetus, but also back, as many commentators have suggested, to the 19th century figure of the flaneur, that aimless urban wanderer, as taken up by Charles Baudelaire and others to characterise a particular social time and place in Paris. John Uri, amongst many others, then appropriated this strolling figure of the flaneur as a forerunner of the modern tourist who walks to experience new places, whether at home or afar, and often typically to photographically document them as a mode of interpretation. While Susan Sontag also makes explicit this link between the flaneur and photography, seeing the photographer as a technologically armed version of the middle class flaneur. And the situationists in the 1950s and 60s revived a re related idea of the derive, meaning a playful or subversive engagement with the city, quite different to the journey or the stroll that entailed a letting go of conventional leisure and work plans, yet still open to being guided by and drawn into attractions and interests through a sensory-led itinerary. The possibilities opened by ubiquitous computing and the smart city for annotating the contemporary urban context with stories, memories and images of past inhabitants, events and places, therefore suggests perhaps innovative ways of rethinking the historical trope of the urban wanderer, receptive to varying degrees of personal preference, to experience, yet desirous of some kind of personal guide or itinerary. The urban armoury of the smartphone provides a new kind of camouflage for urban walking outside of normal routes and habits, yet accompanied by a map, a voice or a thread of recommendations that temper the situationist idea of the derive towards something arguably more approachable and accessible to many, including uh, arguably women in more urban situations. Embedding historical and heritage guided and annotated routes into the urban context also uh, suggests, as already hinted at, the further erosion of physical boundaries of our civic and cultural collecting institutions. So I return um, in, in concluding remarks to the opening analogy uh, of the well-worn idea of the museum without walls, first used to describe the boundless possibilities of the art book enabled by high quality photographic reproduction and vividly captured through the photographic portrait uh, see, seen here of Malraux taken in 1954. Here Malraux explored the reshuffling and juxtaposing of reproductions of works of art, regardless of their origins or contexts, in an album yet as if constructing a personal and portable museum. The visual technology of photography here creating a new kind of representation that was not an encyclopedic survey, but allowed for the making of new associations and meanings. If we then return to the current digital paradigm, new tools for the co-creation of different kinds of portable and imaginary museums and curated interpretations of the city are again rapidly evolving. And um, again, potentially 
flexible and fluid, able to be overlaid onto the physical civic urban realm, but arguably still carrying many of the interpretive and curatorial principles of the museum. Paul Verrio, in his writing on the Museum of Accidents, imagined the museum of the future as a new kind of scenography, where visitors would no longer move through formal physical galleries and spaces of exhibitions, but rather the museographic attention would be, quote, replaced by the time of the exhibition, end quote. We might therefore rethink the Urban Digital Heritage Guide of today as more about finding a time to conduct one's own visit on one's own terms and itinerary. Christine Boyer writes of the potentially liberating possibilities of representing urban collective memory by, quote, drawing out associations and projected ideals to construct our own storyline as we travel from picture to picture. She goes on, we must learn how to mark our own desires, this visual order already manipulated by stereotypical forms and handed down ceremoniously for our passive consumption. And that these traces of the past might, quote, open on difference. The four snapshots of digital tours and apps presented here offers a glimpse of how the history and heritage of cities can be approached in new and old ways that may indeed allow the user to lose themselves without quite getting lost. But there still seems like a very long way to go in terms of harnessing and sustaining their full creative and subversive urban potentials. Thanks very much. And again, um, it'd be fantastic to have any dialogue or questions uh, that might be sparked from this presentation. Um, and I really look forward to hearing the recording of the rest of the day. Thank you. So the last speaker for this session is Anaïs Aguerre. Uh, Anaïs Aguerre is founder and managing director of Culture Connect, a consultancy specializing in unlocking the international potential of the cultural sector, harnessing its ability to build bridges between people, institutions, and countries. Prior to this, Anaïs worked for 15 years as a consultant and senior museum professional. She was notably head of the international initiatives at the VNA in London, where she led the pioneer partnership between CMG and VNA, resulting in the opening of the new VNA gallery at Design Society in Shenzhen, China, and worked for six years at the British Museum on developing the museum's international strategy and generating innovative income streams. Among Culture Connect's first assignments, Anais has been working as project director for the REACH program, a global initiative on the reproduction of art and cultural heritage spearheaded by the VNA. This led to the signature of the REACH declaration by leading figures of the museum and heritage sector across the globe and the publication of Copy Culture, sharing in the age of digital reproduction. Please welcome Anais Aguer. Thank you very much, uh, Erika, for the uh, introduction of the panel and uh, myself. Before sort of jumping into the topic, I would like also uh, to say a warm thank you to all uh, the organizers behind who have conceived and uh, planned uh, this uh, 2019 Fitch uh, Colloquium. Uh, that was a very impressive sort of uh, uh, work they've uh, been uh, putting together. And of course, thank you very much to Jorge for uh, the invitation uh, today. So as Erika said, my sort of perspective is going to be slightly different. I'm not an architect and I'm not a computer scientist, uh, but I will really sort of look at the big picture here and how, um, uh, which is basically sort of why we are here all today, really explore uh, what lines behind uh, the immense premises that digital technology um, offers to the field of historic preservation and more broadly how it is shaping the way we're building tomorrow's heritage. Uh, the development and democratization of uh, technologies such as 3D scanning or photogrammetry um, is radically changing the way we record our cultural heritage, as we've seen from uh, previous uh, speakers this morning. As a result of that, uh, a parallel and ever-growing uh, world of digitized artifacts and monuments uh, is, uh, exist um, in standby, as uh, my colleague who uh, we've referred to a lot today, Brandon Cormier, would say. 
So what does that mean, in particular for the museum and heritage community, which is charged with the mission to preserve, study, and share our heritage, and create the condition and the context to transmit it to future generation? How can these digital uh, copies be uh, on standby, be activated for uh, the benefit of all? And is the response of the global museum community to actually now look towards creating new digital cascord? So that's the question I will try to sort of answer in the 20 minutes we have ahead of us. Uh, I will look in particular at sort of three uh, aspects. So, uh, sorry. So really looking at sort of how this digital uh, technology is shaping or transforming the core mission of the museum and heritage community. I will then look at sort of the necessity to develop a roadmap for us to work uh, more harmoniously together and the importance that this matter be looked at at a global level uh, and also across discipline. And finally, I will sort of uh, really uh, reflect on sort of the work we've conducted with REACH through the REACH initiative itself and REACH inspired uh, project. So a few images that are now sort of familiar to, to you. Uh, I think it's really uh, important to sort of recognize that as we've seen this morning, the uh, digital museum landscape has changed uh, from sort of objects, uh, from collections that you can now sort of see or download on uh, Sketchfab to initiative uh, such as uh, the work that Econem is doing in bringing this technology in the museum context to maybe more sort of controversial initiative like the Nefertiti Act uh, of um, Nora Al-Badri and Nikolai Nels, we can see that those digital reproductions are now sort of a part of uh, the museum life. However, what's really interesting is that all these examples demonstrate that these initiatives are most of the time spearheaded or pushed by non-museum people uh, and really sort of inviting or provoking uh, the museum community to react rather than sort of necessarily being sort of the force uh, behind this initiative. And I think for many of you uh, working at the crossroad between heritage and uh, technology, sort of the impact and the benefit of digital recording for a museum would be a no-brainer uh, when you think about sort of this enormous challenge that museums have to keep objects forever. Um, of course, we can really think easily how um, this digital record uh, have um, uh, really are representing uh, interesting, uh, increasing interest to keep precise data on the state and the changes state of an original, as we've seen in particular in the presentation of uh, Heave. We could also see how they could really inform uh, decision uh, uh, making in terms of uh, conservation in uh, the museum. Uh, they are also sometimes uh, becoming really sort of the only surviving record of an original uh, when an original is lost. And they also enable sort of a new ways to engage with the public. So a lot of the functions that the museums have to tackle with. However, uh, even though I was saying sort of there is sort of a new digital landscape, this digital landscape actually looked quite uncertain. And to some degree, uh, the REACH declaration, which was launched uh, in uh, December 2017 at the VNA, was somehow a response to this un uncertain digital uh, landscape uh, characterized by raging uh, dis disparities between museums in terms of the way they had uh, adopted those new technologies and um, the whole idea behind uh, the REACH declaration was really to empower the museum and heritage community to embrace with confidence these uh, revolutionary um, opportunities that the fourth industrial revolution uh, was offering in terms of uh, new uh, advances in technology and, and connectivity and how that could really activate uh, new ways of learning, creativity, innovation, audience engagement and preservation. 
So what was really the genesis of uh, this REACH initiative and how can we see in that uh, initiative an invitation to invent a new digital cash court? So I think, I mean, today uh, um, we've seen a little bit of that this morning and we'll hear more uh, around sort of the challenges and sort of the, the questions that we're wrestling with when it comes to sort of these digital copies and what are sort of the ethical questions around that as well as the technical one. And I think it's important to uh, remind ourselves that to some degree we've been there before. Um, I would like to bring you uh, back for a moment to the 19th century uh, when Sir Henry Cole, uh, the founding director of the VNA, had really sort of somehow already sort of set the scene for the discussion we're having today. Um, he was uh, an, um, an industrialist and an innovator, but most importantly, he had seen really the benefit of bringing art, science, and technology together as an engine of uh, social development and economic growth. And this vision was really sort of uh, the driver behind the first exhibition of 1851, um, which, are, which um, uh, led to the development of the VNA. Um, and in um, the second, uh, um, Second uh, international exhibition in Paris in 1867, he actually sort of formalized a bit more his thinking about how uh, the technological advances of the time, mainly photography, electrotype, new technique in uh, cast, could really help uh, push this sort of ideal of the Victorian times of uh, highlighting the masses and really providing sort of large access to culture to a wide, br a broad range of people. At the time, there was no sort of EasyJet or other sort of low-cost company, and the Grand Tour of Europe was really uh, uh, a benefit just for the few. So the whole idea behind uh, Henry Cole was really to broaden access to culture as a way to sort of improve um, society and its development. So he wrote this uh, convention now called the uh, Henry Cold uh, uh, Convention of 1867, really promoting universally the reproduction of works of art uh, for the benefits of all countries. And the idea behind was really to use this new technology to capture uh, the best example of uh, architecture and works of art that would have been created by the human uh, brain uh, and the hands, uh, and share that sort of uh, broadly across uh, Europe. Uh, and one of the really interesting thing is not only this led to sort of the development of large cast courts across the world, but also, and I will quote here uh, Professor Mary uh, Landing, uh, Cole's convention marks a key moment in the translation of national monuments into portable global patrimony. And really what it has started is really this idea, um, and we could maybe discuss that uh, further in, in the talk, of really sort of the mobility of this uh, heritage and sharing that sort of at a global uh, stage. So if we're now moving sort of uh, moving um, forward, fast forward to the 21st century, our question at the VNA was to sort of really explore how the condition have changed. We were facing sort of two uh, big sort of uh, uh, elements. Um, sorry, I've moved. Uh, yeah. So uh, we, we were sort of really facing two major uh, forces. On one side, this fourth industrial revolution, as I was saying earlier, really transforming the way our museum practice was uh, going to develop in the future, in particular in connection to preserving and passing on this heritage to um, uh, our contemporaries and future uh, generation. But also at the same time, there was sort of a growing awareness about the uh, destructive forces that threaten our uh, shared heritage, um, pollution, terrorism, conflict as we've seen uh, with Eve's presentation uh, this morning, uh, but also mass tourism. And so the question for us was really to sort of start to understand how uh, looking back to uh, Henry Cole's sort of initial uh, convention, how we could rethink this question of uh, sharing and preserving at a moment of disruption in technology and how can our sector really uh, 
would uh, be able to use that for its benefit. And it was really interesting. Again, I won't sort of expand too much on the uh, World of Fragile Part, which was curated by Brandon Cormier, but it was a key milestone in moving towards the REACH project. The idea was really, uh, as explained by David, to really sort of rethink the history of copies, and in particular, the implication that new technology uh, had on uh, the way we were sort of studying, preserving, and sharing our uh, museum collections. And in this work, uh, Brandon did a fantastic work in unearthing this uh, convention. And the whole idea for us was really to sort of think we are, have quite similar conditions to what Henry Cole was uh, looking at, which is sort of advancing technology, a combination of a desire to preserve and transmit heritage, uh, and this desire of sort of broadening access to culture to uh, a large uh, uh, group of people. Um, and that's really how we started the uh, uh, REACH uh, initiative. The whole idea was really to bring together the global, and the global uh, museum and heritage community to explore how uh, our imperial heritage could be preserved in our digital era and debate creative opportunities that copying uh, these works offer to global uh, audiences. And we really wanted to sort of create a new frame, framework and a new network for museums to work together in that and be less on sort of the receiving end, but becoming a bit more proactive in this debate. In order to do that, we were keen to sort of really broaden our uh, scope of research to the entire globe. Even though uh, Henry Cole was claiming that he was looking at sort of the entire world uh, in, uh, to a large extent that was very Eurocentric. So the idea was really to sort of go bring this Henry Cole convention to the world through a series of five roundtable discussions that we uh, did uh, organize with a series of partners, so creating a, a global consortium of museum to really explore uh, how the museum community could engage more proactively with those issues, looking at sort of uh, Europe, uh, the Middle East and Africa, the Americas, and really sort of also trying to um, uh, have a very sort of cross-disciplinary approach. And I will pause on that uh, for uh, a moment because I think that's one of the interesting aspect of today's colloquium is also to bring sort of different perspective on this issue. And I think one of the important thing that we have to sort of bear in mind in sort of progressing is to make sure that um, we are looking at that across discipline uh, and that the museum and heritage community could really uh, take part in the conversation. So in order to do that, we organize really a sort of a core group of museums, but work with, as I was saying, people across the sector. So looking at sort of startups, uh, working in the digital uh, field, uh, like uh, uh, Econem, lawyers, uh, working on sort of issues of copyrights, conservators. Uh, and I have to say, it was really impressive to see how um, those technology are used in uh, at the Hermitage. They're really sort of at the cutting edge of using um, digital uh, data to really make uh, preservation decision, but also looking at sort of uh, learning officers in museums, so really embracing the whole range of people who could have an interest or an impact on these digital heritage issues. And the idea was really to also bring this conversation and um, that was mentioned a bit earlier, this conversation to sort of a more political stage. Um, so we launched the uh, initiative at UNESCO and closed it uh, there once we had sort of uh, completed the whole range of um, consultation. And the reason it was important, it was really to sort of bring this debate outside of just the expert field, but also to make um, decision makers uh, uh, realize the importance of investing in this digital heritage uh, dimension uh, and uh, also realizing that a lot of the questions that was apparent throughout the, the um, consultation, most of the issues and discussions that people have or 
problem that they are tackling with are shared. And the response to how to use better uh, this technology uh, to better uh, accomplish this mission of preserving, uh, studying, and sharing this collection has to be looked at uh, collectively. Um, there are a number of issues such as storage that would have to, or investment in storage infrastructure that no individuals or individual institution could tackle. So we created sort of this uh, declaration, which is some sort of a roadmap uh, for the museum and heritage community to start to establish sort of more standardized approach. We developed sort of technical uh, uh, guidelines to accompany that. There was a publication, Copy Culture, that was mentioned earlier, and the start of an, uh, an online uh, research space housed uh, on the VNA website to start sort of opening up even more uh, this, uh, up this rich dialogue and conversation. As I was saying th at the beginning, this uh, declaration was signed by a number of key leaders in the field, and I think that's uh, an important sort of asset of this project, which is sort of really starting to have leadership of museum and heritage sector to really start to understand the potential and the importance for the sector to engage with those uh, topics. And I, I won't sort of read the, the, the list, but it's really important to have those key leaders and, and uh, important sort of museum uh, in uh, uh, who have endorsed this, uh, this declaration. And it's really sort of a first step towards us working more uh, together and more intelligently around this technology and own it and reclaiming a little bit the role of museums and heritage in this, uh, in this conversation. So looking at sort of the first point of reproduction, which is really sort of the topic of, uh, of this panel, the key uh, aspect was really to encourage museums and, and cultural uh, uh, heritage communities to uh, record uh, for the benefit of the public of today and future generation, but also really start to uh, standardize the ways they were sort of documenting this initiative to make sure that, again, when looking at um, the preservation of this digital record, we could actually use them and make sense of them now and in the future. And we're able to sort of uh, exchange and, and uh, share those digital data more easily. One of the issue when we look at the museum sector and digitization is the fact that for many years, a lot of the system have been sort of closed system. A lot of bespoke um, uh, software have been built for a museum and that was a very sort of limiting uh, approach to museum, uh, uh, really embracing the, uh, the digital world. And one of the questions that we tried to sort of address with which was really to sort of have a more open approach to digitization and really thinking in terms of collaboration and exchange and circulation. I won't sort of go through sort of all the, the, the aspect, but we looked also at sort of storage, which is another sort of key uh, aspect, um, the notion of sharing and the aspect of uh, collaborations. But in order to sort of give you a little bit more of the sort of uh, aspect of how uh, this rich initiative work, I would like to sort of give you um, two examples. Um, uh, which were sort of uh, developed as sort of rich inspired project uh, at the VNA. I think uh, there are those examples and a few others, but one of the things which was interesting with this document is that even though it's not a binding document, it really created a, a roadmap for our sector and also a point of reference for many people working in conservation department or learning teams who had started to understand the potential of digital uh, uh, reproduction and had really sort of um, uh, um, really sort of trying to sort of look at how we could uh, really build, uh, build on that. Um, at the Louvre uh, that started uh, their contribution to reach really started to open at government level in France the question of open access. Um, 
uh, one of the uh, experts on the board is now looking at developing blockchains to really understand how we could identify the original copies, which will again open up a whole new uh, world for, uh, for museums. But on the v and uh, side, and I will skip because I think I'm a bit late, we've been sort of working, and again, the v and is not necessarily at the forefront of, of uh, digitization, but the work on REACH really started to push a bit those boundaries. Um, one of the projects was the, uh, a collaboration with uh, uh, Rapid Form at the uh, Royal College of Art, and we scanned 25 objects from the collections um, using uh, uh, hand-holding uh, um, digital uh, light scanning. Uh, and I will just sort of quickly look at the, uh, the criteria to sort of choose this object. The list of criteria, uh, I won't sort of go through that, but it's just to sort of highlight the fact that those interventions in museum are not uh, neutral. Uh, the fact that we are selecting this on those, uh, on those terms and um, uh, then sort of encountering sort of the technical limits uh, of the, the technology today uh, means that what we are passing on for the future is the result of uh, not such a neutral uh, dimension uh, and, uh, and we have to really think about how we select and how uh, technology could also limit and uh, influence sort of what is going to be transmitted to, uh, to the future. And as sort of a spin-off from this uh, scanning project, we brought uh, four objects to a school of uh, blind children who had um, technologies for, uh, who had uh, 3D printed technologies. And it was an interesting way to see how scanning the collection was enabling us to really sort of make visible the invisible and reach out to sort of new uh, audiences. But again, the selection of the object were uh, linked to sort of the limitation of the technology, the limitation of uh, our sort of financial power behind that, but this is the thing that are going to be sort of shared and, sp and spread. So we need to really think about um, the selections and the criteria when we, we choose uh, what we are uh, actually sort of digitizing and what will be the implication in the long terms. Uh, ideally, you would want to really have uh, this sort of digital cascade using uh, and sharing sort of the best example of, um, for in the case of the VNA, of our uh, works of art and design and architecture, and be able to share that uh, really sort of openly. One of the questions which is remaining uh, open is the need to sort of uh, maintain this uh, dialogue open, built on this community that we've started to. Uh, to uh, gather through the REACH initiative, looking at uh, ongoing uh, updates of these uh, digital standards as technology is evolving more rapidly than the museum sector, and really uh, pay attention to sort of the, the ethical question around that. And that's why I really think it is important to make sure that even though technology is uh, evolving at a really rapid pace, and the museum at large is still very unfamiliar with all these uh, technologies, it is important that they are part of this conversation, and that's what we've tried to uh, create with REACH, really this uh, open dialogue with museums and people with the technology to ensure that um, these digital uh, cascades that we are creating are going to be truly representative of uh, our heritage for future generation. Thank you. One of the themes that really uh, threaded through all of your presentations, uh, including Hannah's, um, was one related to this notion of access. Uh, David, you talked about mobility. Eve, you, you spoke specifically about access. Um, uh, Anais, you spoke about transmission and that, those sort of enlightenment ideals of of uh, learning and creative innovation. Uh, and Hannah spoke as well about this idea of participatory curation, um, that the public is engaged in part of this process. And so I'd like to ask you all, or individually, or you can speak with each other, um, about what some of the tensions are in your own work in relation to that more kind of positive and inclusive theme and the exclusion that is inherent with this endeavor, meaning uh, data and recording are not neutral. 
right? They, they, uh, and curation is not unbiased, whether professional or done by a general public. Uh, and so I'd like you to talk a little bit about how you reconcile those tensions or, or face those tensions in your own work. Want to start? Steve, do you want to start? <laughs> no, it's, um, for, for, for us it's a big issue because uh, we have um, a lot of data, uh, sensible data as well, huh, from uh, country at war. Uh, so, our, our idea is to draw like an ethic from, frame about uh, what we want to do in the field first, uh, uh, which kind of data we, we, will, uh, we, will, uh, we will take, so cultural data without any uh, political uh, idea in it. And uh, the most important thing for us at the beginning is to, is to take uh, objective data. I mean uh, photography. With a, uh, uh, with a drone, it's an automatic way to take picture, so it's like objective. Huh? It, we cover a, te a territory, and uh, so this data for us is a raw material that can be shared to everybody. So everybody is uh, people from those countries, the government, but also people from the museum, people from our country. And then after they, they can, for this, uh, I think this, this is important to, to, to engage, engage ourselves to share uh, this, this data, this raw and objective data, because then after uh, anybody can do uh, what they want with this. Huh? And ourselves, we do a specific narrative with that uh, during this exhibition, but it's our own view uh, uh, we, we bring to the public. But the raw data needs to be accessible to the scientists, but also to the public, in order for everybody to have his own uh, interpretation of it. So for, for us, the, the ethical frame is uh, this notion of objectivity in the way we, we collect the data. Uh, and then after, uh, we consider that everybody can do what they want with this. But everybody still have to get access to the raw uh, data and the raw material. But this is a, also, a, for, for us, a technical issue because it's a huge amount of data, so we have to, to find you know, this, this kind of uh, 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 technical uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, engineering, uh, to get this easy access to the point cloud we saw uh, at the beginning. But for us, it's a very important issue. That's why we have in our team, we are a team of uh, 15 people, but in this team, there is at least five people who are working specifically on this subject. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask you to respond to that, David, in <laughs> yeah. particular because of, I mean, the yeah. term you used, optical bias. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I have, I have a lot to say about the way um, <laughs> reproductions, uh, and, and as, as Anaya said, put it so well, the way reproductions kind of imagine a certain kind of subject, mm -hmm. right? So the, the reproduction always has an idea of the capacities of somebody in terms of the way that they might enjoy, appreciate, or, or, or preserve culture. Um, I think, you know, to, to, to some of Eve's points, I think, you know, that is a very large issue, but another issue that came up with my work with Anais and, um, and Brendan um, is the, the, the more that um, culture, let's uh, call it a broad term, becomes digitized and becomes data, the more we need to concentrate on, on who, can, who can access this and whether the infrastructure is there to access it. And a very interesting point that came up in the conversations is the, the lack, you know, the very, as we all know, the very uneven distribution of access to the kinds of quantities of data that people like Eve and, other, and many others work with. What, what wasn't discussed in, in the um, conversations with Reach, if you take that map of the uneven um, access to data in the form of, you know, computation and data networks, and map that to the sites that tend people, pres digital preservations tend to concentrate on, they're located in the same place. And that, mm -hmm. Um, in the same geographic zones. And so that, I think, requires uh, some self-reflection because there is a very big disconnect there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I would, I, I would uh, agree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I think the, uh, it's linked to this question of uh, digital divides and sort of maybe the risk of uh, neo-colonial uh, uh, approach to, uh, to preservation. I mean, exactly this, this point of where the technology is and where mm. are the sites where the sites are. Um, and I think, again, sort of 
to sort of combine David and Eve's point, I think the, the, the solution is really not to rush in, but to really make sure that we have uh, time to reflect on the consequences of using those uh, technologies. Because even though uh, apparently they are more neutral, because yes, that's automatic uh, sort of uh, more objective data that you're capturing, you still make the decision of going in certain mm -hmm. places versus others. And we still are uh, the ones with sort of the tools and the skills for that. One of the points that uh, the REACH Declaration is putting forward is the, the necessity also to ensure that there is sort of a, a, a transmission also of knowledge and, and expertise uh, and really sort of a greater collaboration at a global scale in terms of how people could be trained and, and own this technology. On a more positive things, I think there is, in terms of access and this question of reclaimed history, uh, I think putting on um, this digital uh, reproduction has enabled or provoked a bit more um, uh, understanding of the multiplicity of layers around digital narrative. Uh, and I think that's, mm -hmm a progress in sort of a more even sort of approach to uh, transmitting and how we, we share and move frames sort of uh, this heritage. There is sort of the space now to have multiple voice uh, telling the story of, uh, of one object. But again, that mm -hmm. comes back to the question of, of, uh, of context. But I think it's something that people working in that field needs to have really um, at the forefront of their thinking, because that's going to shape uh, tomorrow's heritage. Another quick question, um, and I and I want to tie this <clears throat> to a longstanding uh, uh, kind of ideal within the heritage realm of stewardship, mm -hmm. and the way in which recording uh, mm -hmm. is sort of seen as a form of stewardship, a, a way of of, of preserving. Um, maybe not always the place or the object, but the idea of the place or the object. Uh, and I'd like to kind of taking um, a cue from your, your comment, uh, talk a little bit about our role beyond stewardship. Uh, you talked about activism. Um, I would also bring in the word accountability. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, certainly in Hannah's presentation, uh, she was you know, bringing this idea of, well, as professionals, we're not just the curators. There's this public curation process. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you see our role as activists within this preservation mm -hmm. arena, mm -hmm. uh, or as those having to be accountable for very real decisions about the built environment, mm -hmm. even if only made digitally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I. As, as a historian, I'm completely fascinated by, by, his, by people like me, historians mm -hmm. who, have, who have had to invent processes of reproduction to represent ideas that could mostly live in writing, but they did, were not seeing in historic reproductions of artifacts. In other words, to project the past and the futures of artifacts, the, to try to reinvent um, uh, practices and ideas about, about, about what a reproduction could be and what it can represent. So for me, I think in, in my own capacity, you know, I, I do believe that reproductions are, are extraordinarily powerful um, in, terms of the, in terms of creating the whole notion of like heritage and crisis, right? I kept um, listening to the, I'm hijacking your questions a bit, but I, I question a bit, but I kept thinking today, like a few of the presentations or others will talk about world culture and crisis. And, and I think through my own work, I wanna step back a bit and, and understand that the way that we make reproductions, what we choose to reproduce, how we reproduce it, creates the whole idea of a, of a, of a, you know, a, a, world, cult, of a world culture, right? And the idea of crisis. So you know, I, I personally think the responsibility is to step back a bit from the images of ruination and destruction and to um, be very careful about the kinds of imagery and ideas that we map and reproduce and push out there. Because I do think they, um, they um, I don't want to keep using the word reproduce. They reiterate certain ideas. Mm -hmm. they, we lose kinds of sensibilities and perceptions of people that actually experience these things among many, many other variations of experience. So um, I think right now is a very key moment to, for, for anybody who's involved with this to have a lot of reflection about the kinds of images they're reiterating with their work and to be careful about what that's going to lead to in these sites. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I, I guess the, the problem with Palmyra is not just an issue of reconstruction, but of you know people, obviously. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. Any 
Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think. I mean, it's. A, I think for me there is sort of this ongoing tension between very short term and the long term, and the museum world is always trying to sort of bridge the gap between the immediate mm -hmm. and sort of this historical uh, perspective, and I think. Uh, the players uh, who are entering this field uh, are living in different sort of time frame. Um, so technology is evolving extremely rapidly, uh, and therefore people working on that uh, in that field are used to work in a specific sort of time frame, which differs from the museum one. And I think for me. Uh, the beauty of the work we've done with REACH is to really bring all these people together to really sort of find what is the right balance and how, and I think this notion of pose and think about what it is that we, are, we reproduce, I can't find another word, but yeah, what, what do we digitize? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and what we put to the world, because this is, uh, this is shaping our collective imagination, our collective culture, and, um, and it's not just sort of cracking on a technical issues, it's about sort of bigger and more lasting questions. So for me, one of the solution is um, really to sort of make sure that we still have a platform like REACH where people from different perspectives, working in different sort of time frame, are able to actually look and explore those questions uh, together. And uh, right, further that, I think uh, technology is also a very good way to involve uh, the community itself, mm -hmm. as a community from the different country we work, uh, uh, to, to think about their own uh, 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 heritage and to think mm -hmm. it differently than uh, with, uh, we, uh, in a different view uh, from us. And uh, um, we, we, we have been working a lot in this very close collaboration with archaeologists in Syria, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, uh, by training them to this technology of photogrammetry th that is easy uh, to, to use on the field because you just need like a, 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 a camera. And I saw a lot this uh, enthusiasm from, from uh, their side to, to produce this kind of imagery and uh, to use it as a, as a specialist, uh, as an archaeologist, as an architect, but also uh, uh, to create a narrative about their own uh, history. So I think it's a, it's a link, uh, it's, it's a kind of new link uh, we, 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 we draw between, uh, between a human being and uh, on this, uh, this kind of culture. So it's, a, I think, a great opportunity also. Uh, Everyone. All right, I'd like to open it up to uh, the audience for additional questions. Mario? Oh, thank, you. Yeah. thank you very much for all the presentation. Very interesting. Especially, I, I would like to say that you know, this work from people that have worked in conflict areas is, is very challenging to go and, and, and take the risk of doing documentation, specifically to do something beyond that and to help you know, preserving heritage. However, I see a lot of um, tension in the use of this kind of information. As you know, UAV's regulations around the world are taking into consideration privacy as a very important aspect in when you are taking pictures of, of anything that doesn't belong to you. And this brings to the point as to say, well, who is going to have access to this data and how this access to this data is going to be in detriment to the actual people that live, for instance, in Aleppo mm -hmm. or, or Iraq. And this is a very important question. And I like the point of Anais about, you know, we need to wait and we need to consult. And I think this is the moment we need to consult. We cannot just provide full access to all the data that we have. Now, I want to put you, put you all in, a, in, in, in uh, think about, because one of the most important ethical principles is the conflict of interest, okay? And I see, and I see it from myself too, is that we are utilizing the data that we're gathering to self-promote our mission. And our mission can be very important. We want to preserve, want to conserve. We want to, this information to transcend to the future. But how do you see yourself? Are you entering a conflict of interest when you display this information worldwide 
and you get the next project because all of us, we all have to pay mortgages. I don't know if everyone has. And we also have to feed our employees in our organizations or to teach our students. So how do you see that conflict of interest, specifically as a heritage recording specialist? Thank you. <laughs> um, yes, um, <laughs> I think um, well, we, we, we all trying to solve a, a general problem that is uh, not only my problem, that is a problem also of communities, a problem of how, how to, to transmit this, uh, this monument that are disappearing uh, for the future generation. And it's not only uh, the promotion of, uh, I mean, of a technology, of a project, of a, it's, it's, it's more a philosophical idea we want to bring. And this is just one uh, one way to one way to, to do it. There is other way, but uh, I'm fin, I'm trying to promote this way because there is a certain effi efficiency uh, uh, um, on the field, and uh, there is now sort of community, local community, who help us to do that. But I think fin, I don't see really like a conflict of interest because there is some fin, it's a philosophical problem uh, uh, problem that uh, uh, it us all i mean uh, from from our team from from uh, from the different uh, community so i'm not really indeed we are creating a, a narrative we are creating we are promoting this na na narrative here in europe uh, elsewhere in arabic country but for me it's just it's just just a way to to reach this goal, and it's a so general goal that I I don't uh, I really don't don't see this uh, this uh, this um, this conflict in my work anyway. Um, thank you for the wonderful start to the day. I mean, this is it's a little cold in the room, but it just warmed up, you know, with these. <laughs> Fabulous, fabulous talks. And I just want to take it back to this question of, um, all of you sort of touched upon it, um, the notion of the way in which these representations and technologies sort of um, uh, embed uh, a sense of community within them and, 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 and in a sense lay forth for us um, the biases that are within that community, whether it be the biases of our own discipline or the biases of the of the, you know, f uh, people engaging with the heritage, and in particular with David, I thought it was really interesting the way that you began to look at um, the broader field of of, of bodily experience um, as a way to try to unpack those biases uh, um, and to think about this this. What I guess Baxendale would call like the period eye, you mm -hmm. know, that the, what would what would a Renaissance, how would a Renaissance person experience mm -hmm. this heritage object versus the way we do? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, one of the themes that seemed to come through in all the presentations is that the, these new technologies, in a sense, shape our period eye. That we, our own understanding of the world, is mediated through these new technologies. And I wanted just to have you reflect a little bit uh, in Anais's question about speed, because if we think of, for example, photography, the way that it shaped our understanding of heritage, you pointed to that. Between the first photographs in the mid 19th century and the point when everybody had a foot, you know, a camera in their hand, uh, it was like a hundred years. You know, uh, it's really after World War II when everybody has, you know, a Polaroid or what have you. And it was still expensive cameras. But it's really been 10 years uh, between no one having uh, access to these technologies and everybody having access to these. They're, they're cheap. Like, you know, they're so cheap that we can afford them as a program. <laughs> you know, as a Columbia University. So um, I just wanted to have you reflect on that a little bit because the, 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 the compression of time, in a way, uh, I, I, there is a, a, a sense of playing catch up, mm -hmm. but to what degree are we able to sort of pull back from that? Because it seems that a lot of the 
the biases that we are finding in this new technology are the kinds of biases that we um, ascribe to photography and its relationships to colonialism, to opticality, and so on. So how, is it possible for us to step back and, 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 and sort of begin to unpack new kinds of our, our, own, our own biases? Mm. Um, and have you found biases that you find are, let's say, surprising to you and that you might not find in earlier histories. Mm. Um, I don't know if that's... Can I? Yeah. 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 Um, I forget the, the term of uh, Bruno Latour's, but it, it's really nice in the, for this conference, which is this idea that, that, that you know, there's... Um, most people think of technologies as successions, and he talks about the, the coexistence of mutual technologies, which is to say that we have, um, you, you know, air-powered um, uh, nail guns, but people still use hammers, right? It's not mm -hmm. something that we threw out with the nail gun. And I think with processes like photogrammetry and, and several other things we'll see today, we'll see a similar thing where photography and um, digital photography and digital software are moving um, parallel and are informing each other back and forth. So it's not a replacement, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's kind of, it, there's still a lot of developments with digital photography that are, that are informing the photogrammetric work. So I think that's an important idea just to have around. The other thing, I mean, your question makes me think about this um, issue that I'm obsessed with. Like, what is a reproduction, right? Because if I make a drawing of you right now, we would not say that's a reproduction of you in that space. But if Eve flew the drone around you and took a series of photographs and reconstructed it in Agisaw Photoscan, we could say we have a reproduction of Jorge. Um, so, you know, and, I th and there's just to throw out a few more names, there's a very interesting idea by um, the art historian Erwin Panofsky about what a reproduction is. He says a reproduction is some thing or, or phenomena that gets translated through some law of natural science. That can be a photograph, that can be a phonograph needle, that could be an algorithm today. And I think that's so key. And I think that's that algorithm, so to speak, that whatever that thing is that represents science, the natural science of the reproduction is where I personally want to concentrate and where I think the most interesting issues are right now. It puts us more in control of the software processes or has us in dialogue with people that make the software, that make these images, enables us to insert our own values. It's a, just, it's a beginning, it's a place to begin to think about where we might insert ourselves in the, in the kind of the, um, the, the natural science that's always represented by any form of reproduction, light, sound, chromaticity, et cetera. And, th and I do think that, that has the capacity to represent many different um, uh, forms of experience in, in absentia, right? Yeah. I'm just gonna add to that, yeah. uh, you know, thinking about this term reproduction as mm. both a female and a parent. Mm. I think that there are added oh, yeah, dimensions yeah. Uh -huh. to this idea of reproduction in terms of the creative process mm. that, mm -hmm. and, and what we bring to the table that is well beyond a sort of analytical understanding of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm just gonna add that in there. Yeah. The good point. <laughs> <laughs> That's natural science, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. We got uh, Norma sorry. in the back. Hi. Uh, yeah, I have two here. quick questions. Um, one for Anais. Mm -hmm. And is, um, if you could share with us who were your partners for the REACH program in Latin America and the Caribbean. And for Eves, um, if you could share with us some information about the cost involved with not only the recording, but also interpreting and presenting the data. Thanks. Yeah. So th thank you very much for, uh, for this question. So as I was saying, uh, we, we really try to sort of uh, start this plan thinking, okay, we can't just be uh, Eurocentric anymore, like, uh, and claiming that we talk for uh, the universe. And so we really try to sort of uh, work quite broadly uh, across the world, obviously, and that's always the limit. We have limit in times and money. Um, so uh, we work uh, with Sandra Lopez uh, from uh, uh, university. She had done um, uh, key, uh, so from Mexico. So we only had one representative from Latin America and that was Mexico. So in few uh, writings I wrote around sort of that, for me that was one of the failure of, uh, of, the, of the work we, we've done. But it was interesting to really reflect and she, in the book uh, I mentioned before, Copy Culture, she has actually a really interesting uh, section where she talks about this cultural divide and, and the, all these big questions that we are sort of touching uh, upon, uh, upon now. Um, 
I think that's a reflection of the fact that we are still talking, even though we try to sort of be as open as possible, we work with sort of the people who are, we, uh, we keep sort of in the same circle. Uh, and for me, sort of the next step of, uh, of reach is really to create a space uh, online where people could actually comment, share their sort of uh, techniques. Uh, uh, we have these sort of uh, guidelines, technical guidelines, and the idea would be to have them as sort of a working document uh, where people could uh, really share and really use this connectivity we have to sort of bring more people on board. But I think that was yeah, one of the, one of the, the limitations, and we had nobody from the Caribbean. Um, which again, being the daughter of a Haitian person, I find it really sad. But yeah, we, we had sort of this limit and I think um, we were aware of that. Coming back to sort of the previous question on uh, sort of the ethical uh, aspect, I think we are sort of, it's sort of a new frontier and we are testing a lot of things. And as we said, we have this tension between the short and the long term. I think we can't stop progress and, and it's important to sort of embrace with uh, confidence this new technology. But what we need to keep in mind is we need to enter this field being fully awake and aware of uh, the holistic uh, approach that we, that, that, we, uh, that we are taking when we put these things uh, in, out there in the world, what are the consequences and the responsibility for, is for those people. I think one element that uh, the REACH declaration is tracing is the importance of documenting the process. So if you do embark on this project, what was the uh, purpose describing sort of the technology and having sort of as many uh, objective data around sort of the why of the, uh, of the project in order for this to be understood with possibly uh, um, an understanding of the bias that may have sort of come into play uh, in reproducing that. Right. Sorry, I think there okay. was another. I've got, I've got a microphone back here. Uh, no. I think there was a second question. <laughs> I think there was a, a second question as well. There was a second question. Right, the, the second part of the question, just uh, uh, to be clear, it, it, it is be the, the cost is between. Uh, uh, 20,000 uh, for, for, for a monument, uh, a big city uh, like Mosul is, is uh, 200,000. But what is more interesting is uh, um, from where uh, comes the money, the funding, and it's a, it's a real problem. I mean, fin, we worked a lot with uh, UNESCO, with the government, but uh, we found out that uh, every funding comes from a, um, political willing, and some uh, some place uh, like Syria, like Libya, we didn't find the funding. So, so I uh, at the beginning of Econem, I uh, raised money, uh, one one point four million, and I ne negotiate with uh, uh, investor to use part of this money uh, in order to make uh, emer emergency mission. Uh, where 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 I. I think it's necessary to, to go. And uh, this g gave us a little freedom about the, the choice of, uh, of the place uh, we go. And this, thanks to that, we, we did all this work in, uh, in Syria. But uh, in, in our experience, every funding is linked to uh, uh, a political uh, willing uh, at the beginning. So it's very difficult to, to put apart, uh, I mean, uh, politics and culture. And that's it, what we are trained to do, but uh, there is a lot to do in this field. Do make a quick comment? Yeah, yeah, just a very quick comment. I think one of the solution is, again, to keep this question at a global level. I mean, the, the broader we, we are, the, the less risk there is in terms of this conflict of interest or advancing one specific <coughs> agenda. So keeping the platform to sort of dialogue collectively mm -hmm. at a global scale is really important, I think. Okay, Norman, and then we have a, I want a mic down here, please. One Norman is down here. Okay, I, ha I have three small comments, but they may not be small depending upon the response, and they represent all three of you. The first is that uh, something was said a few minutes ago 
that really conveyed the spirit of egalité. And the comment was, I, I fear, a little too early in the process, which was that the raw data itself should be accessible to scientists, by which I think you meant scientists, engineers, technology people, and so on, as well as to the public. And the, the problem there is that despite the fact that the public, and I include myself in part in that, we see the amazing power now of our cell phones and our personal computers, but even here in the school, Jorge said we, we are doing this work, which we are for sure, but even here where we have in our lab, we are told the, the best computers in the school right now, it can take days for our students to download files from the work that they've done in the field. So now we compare that to what's available to the public, it's a dilemma. Second, second comment is, and for this it's definitely not too late, is that I think this is a moment to sharpen the terminology, not the technology, which is getting sharper daily, but the terminology that we use in the field. For example, I am driven insane by the term digital preservation because it's a term that for well over a decade has already been used in a different community with some slight overlaps through museums to this community, and by that it means the preservation of digital files right. that institutions have and are now having difficulty with files from 10, 15, 20 years ago that they need to be able to preserve and, and modify. So the sharpening of terminology is exceptionally, exceptionally important, I think. And then the third comment is, applauding Anais for mentioning electrotypes as well as CAS, because most people think of this only in terms of CAS. What's interesting to me is that that period of time when Henry Cole was starting to consider this was also the moment when, particularly in France, the process of elect electrotyping became much more common. And electrotypes, interestingly enough, have now become valuable in and of themselves, and especially because in the case of electrotyping of metals and and bronze plaques and so on, that we can sometimes see, well, they did the electrotype from a particularly sharp example, or they did the electrotype from a poor example that they had in their collection at the time. So there is new comparative information, so congratulations on saying that. I would add, however, that electrotypes at the time, 1850s, 1890s, was the great peak period of electrotyping, that they also represented a confusion to collectors to dealers to the public simply because electrotypes made in as hollow things were filled with more metal so that they had exactly the same heft, not precisely, but reasonable replica, shall we say, of the heft. They were then patinated so that they looked like the original metals. So we ask the question today, were they meant to deceive in part? Were they meant to educate? Were they meant to offer replicas of things that institutions couldn't have, or within the art market, were they meant to fool people into spending money? Yeah, well, it's, yeah. It's all, yeah, that's, a, that's a, a big one. I'm not an expert in electrotype, and I will sort of encourage you to sort of read what uh, Angus um, Patterson at the Vienna, he just uh, wrote a, a very interesting book on that, so I, I recommend sort of the, the read. Um, I think that's the same. I think there were sort of multiple because there was sort of a, there were a commodity as well, and there was a, a market for uh, for uh, this reproduction. I think the idea of the, the in the case of the Vienna that was really sort of educational and sort of being able to sort of uh, inspire. Uh, uh, a, a larger public in order to sort of have access to uh, to this reproduction or, or, or replicas rather than fooling um, uh, the visitors. I think, I mean, that's a big question and a, and a big debate. I think this question of copies, reproduction, is also inviting us to come further to the question of uh, authenticity and, and, and context, and it's sort of a big question, probably we won't, won't really ha have time uh, to deal with that, but again, I think it comes back to expressing the intention of the, uh, of the pro of whatever sort of reproduction endeavor you're on and making sure that it is recorded with the, uh, the actual uh, digital record in order for future generation to make their mind about whether we were biased and what we were trying to do, but I think documenting the purpose and why we did something might um, lift a bit of uh, uh, 
the sort of personal bias that we can bring into this project. Well, no, I, I'm, I'm fully agree with the question of the terminology. I mean, uh, I worked a lot with uh, archaeologists and. Uh, and uh, it's completely different to save, I mean, preserve the image of a site and to preserve the site itself. Uh, there is, <laughs> uh, and the problem is there is a confusion between this. Uh, and um, uh, for example, for, for, for an archeologist, if you have the image of a site, you cannot dig the image to see what is mm. inside the site. So you lose, uh, uh, a huge amount of uh, data knowledge uh, inside the, inside the site. So, uh, indeed, there is this. Uh, the problem is a 3D uh, 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 um, create like this very impressive imagery, and people think that okay. So we we are we are now the virtual site. So the the real site don't uh, uh, we don't need it uh, anymore. But uh, indeed. All the knowledge uh, of the history, uh, of the historical layers of the site, the sedimentation is in the matter. It's not in the visible uh, 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 image of the site. So we really need to, to, to make the difference between, between that. And the, um, so the 3D model is just a tool to investigate uh, what can be visible, but it's not a tool that can help us to understand the, la the, la the layering of, uh, of the site and the sedimentation. Jorge, do we have time for one more quick question? Okay. Um, so I, I make a lot of images that are similar to the processes that you've been talking about today, and I just had a couple of sort of overarching questions about what the scene you guys involved in are like and what the people's needs are. Um, mostly like, as far as preservation goes, when using photogrammetry or laser scanning or whatever you're using, there's this digital part of it, but then there's like an immense um, manual part of it before the rendering even starts. So like you shoot the images and what you, what you get in your initial render is always gonna take like a lot of work to be seen the way the eye sees it. So I think there's like an authorship and like a copyright question right there. And that's before you click render. And when you click render, uh, a lot of people use like Amazon web servers or whatever they're going to use to make that process not, not the worst ever. Um, and I think there's like real security questions there when you relate them to uh, like stuff like you're doing where you scan a large environment with a drone. Um, God forbid that environment would uh, be the target of something terrible. And uh, that scan might be used for planning of that because it's very mathematically accurate. Um, and then lastly, kind of what you were talking about with reach, I, I w would like to get a, a better sense of like where the blind spot is, because like having worked in scanning and VR myself, like I know there's a huge disconnect when you're not in the same room with a person to like give them a headset and show them these things, and the online platforms are not uh, are not there, or at least don't have a proper incentive for people on the museum or preservation side to be a part of it, like. Um, it was interesting that you brought up copyright, so I'm kind of trying to think through like why, why as a museum outside of kind of the goodness uh, of the, the own heart and the want to share the collection, like what kind of resources are missing to be able to make the practice a little wider? Should, should I start with that or no? no. As you want. Or yeah, so very, very quickly uh, on, uh, on the, the sort of what are sort of still the, the, the roadblock, I think it's a, a combination of things that are more intangible, which is sort of the mindset of people in, in the museum sector where um, there is a lack of familiarity with the technology and therefore a bit of uh, resistance to invent a new common ground because they feel so far from, from that. Uh, when uh, I mentioned sort of the work that uh, Professor Eugene Chang is doing on blockchain, just the notion of blockchain for many museum colleagues, they just sort of close. Uh, so I think there is these things, which is uh, more about sort of uh, a lack of familiarity with, with, uh, with the world. Then there is the question of um, funding uh, and in particular storage infrastructure because there is the question of where do we store that? And most of the time, museums won't have 
the capacity to actually keep those data uh, uh, and, and do the, the work of then presenting it to the public, which is what they are, they are supposed to, to be doing. So I would say that's probably the two main uh, uh, roadblocks. I don't know, for the, the problem of, uh, indeed, of the security of this data and how this data can be used, uh, indeed, I think it, we need to be prudent uh, in the schedule of re release uh, this data because there is a very sensitive data in the case of conflict. So uh, once th th this data came in, uh, in the sphere of uh, history, it can, it can be released and this must be released uh, to have a better knowledge of uh, the different event. And, but sometime a few, few, few weeks or a few months uh, just aft after a battle, it's indeed difficult to, to broadcast uh, this picture to everyone because there is still the groups that are still are, uh, uh, fighting, fighting together. So uh, we have to share this data with uh, 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 international author authority, for example, UN, uh, U UNESCO, but not uh, the wide uh, public. So indeed, we need to be prudent, but I think our goal in the future is to, uh, to open uh, all this data uh, to have a better understanding of the, of the conflict, of, uh, I mean of the heritage and uh, of the process, it, of the destruction of the heritage uh, itself. So, and then for, for, for the question of, um, I mean of uh, property, um, so we had, we, 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 um, we, we had a discussion with a lawyer in France to see uh, who owns the data. And it's, it's really not easy to know because, uh, for example, the, a, a photographer, a journalist come to Syria, take pictures, the picture on uh, the photographer, the photographer sells the picture, so we can imagine that is more or less the same thing. Uh, so the lawyer was uh, explaining to us as it is like a automatic way of taking picture, what I call objective, it's not fully objective, but uh, <laughs> it's in a way more objective than a photographer who take a picture. Uh, we cannot protect this in, ca uh, in, a, in a intellectual property, but we can protect the model itself that is like a stitching of the picture. Alors, more or less automatic again, but, uh, but uh, in the French law, it will be easier to protect the model than uh, the photography itself, which is not so bad because uh, the raw material uh, should, in the future, uh, should be public. I mean, should be in the public domain because it is like a raw knowledge of, uh, of this kind of event. And then after the 3D model, the exhibition, the image, what all the interpretation you can do with this should be uh, with the ownership of the author of, uh, of, of, of the film. So, but really today it's not clear, uh, even with this uh, lawyer, uh, because this new technology brings new problems. And we try to, to make a parallel with uh, the old technology, which is uh, photography, but everything don't match with that. So it's still uh, uh, ongoing uh, uh, thinking. So I, I am loath to cut off this conversation because it's so interesting. Um, but we have two more sessions, and I expect that many of the questions raised will be threaded throughout the rest of the day. So um, please join me in thanking our speakers.